very good, very secret war in which he never revealed. Throughout his lifetime, he managed to attract venomous hostility and loyal support in about equal measure. Margaret Percy has amassed an enormous amount of first-hand evidence about him, and what you're about to hear is, in one sense, only the tip of the iceberg. Here she is now to present Ruthless Adventure, The Lives of L. Ron Hubbard. May I ask you a question? Yes. Yes? Uh, how old were you when your parents left? I wanted to say two. You wanted to say two? Two? You mean you don't remember your parents? No. What you are listening to is part of a Dianetic auditing session and the voice of L. Ron Hubbard, inventor of Dianetics, founder of the Church of Scientology and well-known science fiction writer to boot. Hubbard was a man of extraordinary contradictions, revered by his followers and labelled a charlatan by his enemies, of whom there are many. In this programme, I propose to take you twice through his career, once to establish the known facts, then again to probe the curious, hidden existence of an individual of unusual notoriety. The fact is that there is no one person alive who knows all about Ron Hubbard. Even his reputation may be less his than that of parts of his church. Hubbard was excluded from several countries and vilified by the judiciary. What, after all, was his crime? to propose an engineering model of the mind and an everyman's method of psychoanalysis. Surely not so dangerous a proposition. Well, we shall see. I have talked with many of Hubbard's friends, followers, family and opponents too. Some you will hear. A few I cannot identify because of attacks they've suffered in the past. But now, let us return down the time track to 1950 and that auditing session with which we began. Auditing means to pinpoint engrams, Painful events buried in the subconscious. There's no hypnotism involved. The patient here is merely relaxed and with eyes shut, concentrating on the sound of her auditor's, Hubbard's voice. Hubbard is encouraging her to relive the moment when she last saw her parents when she was two. Oh, I get it. Take her away. Go over that again. Take her away. Take her away. Take her away. Go it again. 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 No, I won't. Go it again. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. When the patient eventually can review that terrible moment without pain or emotion, then she is said to be clear of the engram. If she were to be cleared of all engrams, then she would be a clear her personality freed to develop, and her potential enhanced. That was Hubbard's idea. He summed it up in a book on Dianetics. In 1950, after months of experimenting of this nature, some enthusiastic doctors and scientists invited Art Sepos, a New York publisher, to observe Hubbard at work. Ron was very, very clear, very convincing. On the other hand, I was very skeptical, naturally, with the publisher and my associate who was a uh, practicing psychotherapist, was completely convinced. How long did it take him to write it? 30 days. By himself? By himself. By the time the book was finished, there were orders for 40,000 copies with cash and clothes. 1950 was a year of mistrust. The shadow of McCarthyism lay across America, and the Cold War was in its third year. It was against this background that Dianetics, the modern science of mental health, became an instant bestseller, and Hubbard, at long last, a success. Well, I think he, he had to be the top person. He wanted to do something that would make Barnum look like a piker. Where did you get that expression from? Him. I heard him say it. The implication to us was he was going to make himself very rich. By 1938, I thought I had a common denominator to all life. After all, I had associated rather thoroughly with 12 different native cultures, not including the people in the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had a pretty good idea, pretty good idea of what this study would comprise by that time. I found out that primitive man and civilized man had a great many things in common, but not all of them had one thing in common, except survival. 
Only survival did they all have in common, whether they were blankets up in Alaska. Ron Hubbard had a message people the world over found irresistible. Local Dianetics groups mushroomed. Many doctors used his techniques enthusiastically, and some still do. But the American Medical Association was not amused. When newspapers quoted Hubbard as saying that Dianetics could cure all manner of ills from asthma to sex deviation, the AMA accused Hubbard of quackery and of encouraging unqualified persons to dabble in psychoanalysis, armed with no more than a diploma in Dianetics. When Hubbard publicly denounced practices such as electroconvulsive shock therapy and lobotomy as crude assaults on the brain, the psychiatric establishment was outraged. A surreptitious war began. Closed meetings were held with Hubbard's name on the agenda. The assistance of government agencies was enlisted, the Food and Drug Administration, the FBI, and even the Attorney General of the United States. So much trouble over the activities of a quack. Hubbard attempted to defend his position by setting up a church, the Church of Scientology. This set Dianetics in the broader context of religion, complete with reincarnation and a philosophy covering everybody's lives, past and present. He also introduced a diagnostic device, a confessional aid. This was the e-meter, which measures body resistance when an individual thinks of a word or idea associated with pain. Cranky or serious? By the end of the 1950s, Hubbard was running Scientology from England. He was at St. Hill Manor in Sussex. It seemed less vulnerable. And in January 1963, the war with the American establishment came into the open with a vengeance. Peter Stumke, who's been a Scientologist for 30 years, was in Washington at the time. All of a sudden, we were being treated like criminals. We were being raided by a government agency in the USA. And our materials, not only did they take the e-meters, but they seized books as well and other things, and they burst in on counseling sessions. And the government, that particular government agency, had begun a campaign uh, which, which labelled the e-meter a quack device. England, too, was becoming less of a safe refuge. Hubbard had acquired a habit of contacting foreign governments when he was abroad, ever anxious to put his techniques and philosophies at the disposal of the world. Suddenly, his organisations were under investigation in a number of countries, notably Australia. Ostensibly, Scientology was charged with malpractice. By February 1966, questions were being asked in the House of Commons at Westminster, but Hubbard had already fled from St. Hill. He left on January the 4th, and I spent the whole day crying. I cried and I cried and I cried. I thought I'd never stop because it was such a loss. The whole atmosphere changed when he went. That was another Scientology veteran, Anne Gregg. Many, like her, felt a deep sense of loss. Soon after, the British popular press began a witch hunt of Scientologists and their founder. And by 1968, in an extraordinarily uncharacteristic move, the government slapped an aliens order on Scientology, a ban which was lifted only three years later. But where was Hubbard to defend his followers? Some felt totally abandoned. I didn't know. I really didn't know. My person that I thought was a friend, he's gone away. So he must have been lying to me somewhere along the line. Leave me alone. John McMaster, a former Scientologist and still a believer. Pam and Ray Kemp, on the other hand, never were card-carrying members of the church, though they were close friends of Hubbard since 1951 and still practice his techniques. Their interpretation of Hubbard's silence focuses on his ambivalence towards government. My personal opinion, in 1966, when he started forming up the Sea Org and he started to leave to go and be on the ships, that was a definite non-confront of things that he had mm -hmm. to handle in England. <clears throat> um, and in South Africa. And, and in South in Africa, Australia. correct. All of the problems were coming to the fore and uh, he did what I call a bunk. He could not handle authority, never has been able to. He could not handle government. Government, that's what I mean. Yet he was always mixed up with it. Right. Like an alcoholic. A profound change came over Scientology when Hubbard, LRH, left England. He moved his personal headquarters onto a ship and called it the Sea Org, as we've heard. There was something profoundly disturbing in this, which the Kemps have attempted to put their finger on from the outside. In one of those late 
lectures around about that time, he made the statement, right, I have now completed my research. I have now done my job. Coincident with that, he brings out this bulletin called Confront of Evil. So now we've got a change in the whole philosophy. First of all, you don't confront it, you just acknowledge its existence and blow it off the line. Now you've got to sit there with it right in front of you. Coincident with that comes the formation of the Guardian's Office to guard the technology. Once he got into um, the Sea Org concept, mm -hmm. the idea of putting the Sea Org together and going off on a ship, after that mm -hmm. is when, and he put in um, heavy ethics, and he put everybody in those funny uniforms with the truncheons and the, the helmets and things. It was at that point, I think, everything changed. The whole, um, the, the basic philosophy has always been there, um, but I think even in LRH, I think LRH changed at that time too. I don't know what happened in his life at that time. Whatever caused the change, the roots lie very deep, as we'll hear later on. The mathematician Perry Chapdelaine is another old hand from the early days. His interest in Hubbard's philosophy has reawakened in the past 10 years, and he says the people in Scientology have changed. Mostly there were engineers, teachers, scientists, uh, professionally trained people that were attracted. And uh, nowadays uh, it seems like there's more arty type people, plus people who come into the organization without a whole lot of education. And they seem to be more gullible now. The church at its height claimed six million adherents, but in an atmosphere of increasing unpleasantness, people began to bail out. Some expressed their disaffection by questioning their absent leader's qualifications for saving mankind. Rumors circulated that Hubbard was becoming temperamental and tyrannical, but then that's always been the problem about Hubbard. It's easier to grasp the rumor than the fact, and even the facts can be misleading. Jerry Armstrong, once assigned by the church to be Hubbard's biographer, is now a defector, at the time I interviewed him, he was being sued by the church for the return of a mass of personal documentation relating to Hubbard and his family. It was Hubbard's diary from Asia and letters which predated Dianetics back into the 30s and 40s and journals which went back even to his, his father beyond that. And clearly I was being defrauded and thereafter the story just kept getting more bizarre and more bizarre until we've arrived at today where I suppose I'm his... I'm his Judas. What happened was that Jerry Armstrong had compared Hubbard's autobiographical writing with his war record and his father's naval record, and they didn't fit. Aghast, he'd taken it to Hubbard for clarification, and none was offered. Armstrong is now silenced. The Church of Scientology settled its dispute with him out of court, one of many legal actions which have been quietly terminated since December 1986. Well, you may ask with such evidence why proceed at all, if all I'm to do is unmask once more L. Ron Hubbard, self-styled scientist, engineer, science fiction writer, explorer, and war hero. This man who discoursed so disarmingly on the subject of his own past. I kept on writing. I wrote more and more successfully. Everything was going along fine. Went down to Hollywood, wrote pictures, things like this. Had a very full life, as a matter of fact, uh, professionally, and all the time, I was hiding behind the horrible secret. And that is, I was trying to find out what the mind was all about. And I couldn't even tell my friends. They didn't understand. They said, here's Hubbard. He's leading a perfectly wonderful life. He gets to associate with movie actresses. <laughs> he knows hypnotism and so has no trouble with editors. <laughs> Was Hubbard a brilliant inventor, a talented showman, or just a get-rich-quick fraud? My every instinct as a journalist said there was something else there that we hadn't uncovered. And that clue was in a book he wrote in 1951, The Science of Survival, where he talked about the use of drugs to change human behavior as an espionage tool. This was a CIA top secret for 26 years. How did he know? Who was the real Hubbard? Well, to find out, I went to America. And in Hollywood, I started off with Forrest Ackerman, Hubbard's one-time literary agent and the greatest aficionado of science fiction and fantasy alive. I asked him how they'd met half a century ago. That was one evening, and as I dated, about 1937 here in Hollywood. At that time, there was a second-hand book and magazine shop run by a 
good old gal named Lucy B. Shepard. Ahead of me, paying out, was a dynamic-looking redhead. As I was standing behind him, I overheard him uh, revealing that he was uh, an author. And so I inserted myself in the conversation and asked if he'd ever written any science fiction. And uh, Lafayette Ron Hubbard said no, but on the, the spur of the moment, he started spinning a, a fantasy. He said, well, you know, here in, in Southern California, maybe about 25,000 years from now, there'd be a, a new ice age, and, uh, and he was off uh, plotting a, a novelette. And it wasn't uh, too long later that he began appearing in Astounding science fiction magazine and its companion unknown. So intrigued was Ackerman by the ingenuity of this young writer that he checked him out and found that Hubbard had been a prolific adventure writer for periodicals like Argosy throughout the 30s. And the judgment of Hubbard's sci-fi peers is interesting as well. In those early days of science fiction, we were a very small community of writers. Now the reason it's called the Golden Age is that when John Campbell became the editor. He brought uh, not only a sound scientific background, but also a much keener uh, appreciation of literary form and, uh, and techniques than was usual among editors of the time. And so the general level of the prose rose steeply under his editorship. Ron so on down the line. was one of the group yeah. because uh, he did a great many stories. He was, and he was uh, facile, yeah. and he, yeah. he wrote a good rip-snorting uh, bloody tale. And I would say his style was good. Yeah. Why isn't he mentioned with all these right, the six or seven or eight that get mentioned all the time in the Golden Age? And it's true he is not so mentioned. It was uh, during this period that uh, he did two works which are regarded as definite classics, uh, one a novel about World War 33 called Final Blackout, that's the science fiction classic, and then in the fantasy field is a novel called Fear. Then I had another stroke of luck. I saw a letter written by Hubbard in 1938 from Hollywood to his first wife. In it, he said he'd made a remarkable discovery which would help mankind. His friend Ray Kemp confirmed what Hubbard had been talking about. In fact, the original, original thesis, which was written circa 1938, 39, a woman on Highland Avenue in Los Angeles had it under her bed during the war. That contained the seeds of what became Scientology and preceded Dianetics. Three shoeboxes full of notes he gave to her and said, look after these for me because when I come back after the war, they're going to be worth a lot of money. Just exactly how Hubbard spent the war was still a mystery. He claimed to have been badly wounded early on and flown back from the Pacific in the Secretary of the Navy's plane. But if he was, his official war record didn't reveal it. However, Perry Chapdelaine, who had worked with Hubbard during the experimental days of Dianetics, pointed me to letters written by John Campbell, which he'd recently edited. Campbell had not only been Hubbard's editor on Astounding, but also his mentor. John Campbell states that Hubbard was in superior fettle until he went to the Navy. When he came back, he was pretty much of a shattered man. And based on his own reading, as well as his brother-in-law, Dr. Joe Winter, who specialized in psychosomatic medicine, uh, both of them felt that there was absolutely nothing in the field of psychiatry that would be able to piece the man back together. But it was so bad, Campbell really did not expect to get a story from, from Hubbard again that would be printable. And uh, a year later, Hubbard was back again in Superior Fettle. And based on that, uh, convinced Joe Winter and himself and a, and a fellow, I believe, by the name of Mike Rogers, that electronic engineer, that uh, Hubbard had discovered something new about the, about the human mind. And that's when all four of them uh, began working with Dianetics prior to the first book coming out. This authenticated for me a letter written by Hubbard in late 1947, seeking psychiatric help and complaining of moroseness and suicidal inclinations. So where was he in that following year to make such a miraculous recovery? We have his word that he was convalescing in Oaknell Hospital, researching in the library. And at the same time, 
he was trying out some new ideas of his own on ex-prisoners of war in the care of a specialist. All of his records were available and he was keeping very, very sharp metabolism tests and other things to show the results of endocrine fluids and extracts on prisoners, you see. Well, it's very simple. All I had to do was get the name of one of his series, take him out in the park, sit down, and do some psychoanalysis and the beginnings of Dianetics and Scientology on him, pull the second dynamic apart and put it back together again, see, and then have him go in and take his metabolism test. <laughs> Quite apart from his psychological research, there are several overlapping and conflicting official records on Hubbard's war, and no indication why he should have ended up in such a mess. I took my problem to Colonel Fletcher Prouty, author of a book on American intelligence and recently retired from the Pentagon. I had five pieces of paper about Hubbard being in Australia early in 1942. He immediately dismissed them as sheep dip, camouflage for Hubbard's real activities. We also know in the same period of time that he had been issued automatic weapons, which was a bit unusual by the Australians, plus the fact, a very intriguing fact, that these Australian records originated from Darwin, 1,800 miles from Brisbane. Which put him well within range of Japanese action and would account for his wounds, perhaps. It took Fletcher Prouty to analyze for me something which other researchers have missed. The codes and file numbers which appeared on even the scrappiest bits of paper relating to Hubbard were intelligence codes, and it confirmed suspicions I'd held about Hubbard's connections since I first saw his record. Papers pertaining to Mr. Hubbard always were marked with correspondence codes that would require them to be delivered to Admiral Nimitz's office. And put it the other way around, when he felt that Admiral Nimitz needed to know something, uh, undoubtedly he took the immediate action of writing to him. Now I know from working with CIA that orders very similar to that were put out by Alan Dulles with his agents. Let me know and don't waste any time. Go back channel, see? That's an old intelligence game. There's lots more evidence about Hubbard's war, but even so, I was left with a dilemma. How did a mere science fiction writer with seemingly sketchy credentials rise to such influence? I realized that the origins of Hubbard's intelligence connections must lie much further back. And what about his father, Commander Harry Hubbard, also United States Naval Reserve, and with a similar, seemingly uneventful career spanning some 40 years? About the most exciting thing he seems to have done was spend time on a tiny island in the Pacific. Again, I sought Fletcher Prouty's help. Guam in the 20s was the outpost of U.S. military in the Pacific. Its greatest importance was it was a radio receiving center. So to have his father serving on Guam in the 1920s must have indicated his father had duties that were rather special. And that leads you again to the world of intelligence, which uh, is a strong possibility. Otherwise, how would all these doors open for his son who at age 17, 18, 19, seems to start off with a rather spectacular career of his own. And it's true, he does. With only sporadic bursts of formal education, the young Ron Hubbard leaps into action. A spell in the military reserve at 16, another in the Marines at 19, each time jumping six ranks to Master Sergeant. Such unprecedented promotion could mean just one thing. Hubbard was being groomed for special duties from an exceptionally early age. He was skilled in radio surveillance. He learned to fly at 16. He held licenses to captain all manner of vessels. Clearly, on the outbreak of war, such talents were needed. But where does that leave our picture of Hubbard? Was he, after all, a patriot whom history would conceal? Ironic, then, if his country later denied and attacked a man who seems to have served it well. But what was really fantastic was what was going on in Hubbard's head right through the war. It made his reunion with his literary agent, Forry Ackerman, memorable. In between uh, the squirts of tobacco, he began telling me a tale so fascinating that uh, he parked in front of my apartment and kept me up till the sun started rising, telling me how during uh, the war he had an operation. And uh, while he was lying on the operating table, he died. And uh, he said he found himself in spirit form 
And as uh, he was wafting there in the air, looking down at the corpse he once inhabited, well, off in the distance, he saw a fascinating uh, wall with a very ornate gate in it. It looked like uh, something out of China or ancient Tibet. Well, having nothing better to do, he drifted on through, and wow, there spread out before him was an intellectual smorgasbord, the like of which the mind of man had never beheld. Here was the answer to the Big Bang. What was God was up to? Did he really rest on the seventh day? And was there life on other planets? Uh, you know, was there reincarnation? Everything that has ever puzzled philosophers down the ages, there it was all in black and white spelled out, and like a sponge, he was absorbing all of this fantastic information. Forrest Ackerman, incidentally, is a founder member of the Los Angeles Science Fiction and Fantasy Club, and it was there, in 1946, that Hubbard struck up a controversial relationship with a brilliant and unorthodox young scientist called Jack Parsons. He was an associate of the British black magician, Alistair Crowley. When I was in Hollywood, I met a friend of Parsons, Kenneth Anger, the art filmmaker. Hubbard came into Jack's life and ruined everything. And Hubbard was what we technically call an elemental demon. He had all the characteristics of a witch. It, and so did this woman that came into Jack's life at the same time, Marjorie Cameron. Marjorie Cameron herself, now Parsons' widow, has a very different view. Hubbard never got into Crowley that much. Uh, but Jack, Jack knew Crowley's work very well and considered himself Crowley's magical son. I believe at that time he was being investigated by the FBI, and Hubbard may have been an agent, as he claims. And I have found further evidence which shows that Hubbard worked with the police in Los Angeles in 1947 and 48. I believe Hubbard's contact with Parsons was for American intelligence, though Hubbard obviously was psychic and had a personal interest in magic. Parsons, incidentally, met his death in a mysterious explosion in 1952, but by then, Hubbard was beset by enemies of his Dianetics techniques. Desperate to get the psychiatrist off his back, Hubbard, according to letters in Perry Chapterlin's possession, sought the advice of John Campbell, the ingenious editor of Astounding Science Fiction. Campbell pointed out, and I have a letter to, to back this up, that uh, the only way that we were going to be able to explore this new uh, world of the mind would be uh, in the field of religion, because there one is free to explore the world of the mind and not be subject to licensure. So the church was not a tax dodge. It was a means of giving Hubbard's auditors the freedom of American hospitals and to stop the psychiatrists hounding them. Many people believe that the hostility which the Church of Scientology has encountered is no more than a product of Hubbard's own paranoia, but a very different view is expressed by the Church's president, Heber Jensch, when people say that. They are not aware of the fact that men like Mr. Ernest Hemingway, in the records of which I obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, was a man who said, yes, I am being chased by the Internal Revenue Service, I am being uh, hounded by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yes, he was also considered paranoid, but the documents show that an FBI program went after him from 1940 forward to destroy that man's capability and to destroy his image and his, uh, his communication to the American people. They tried to do it to Mr. Hubbard. They've tried to do it to every great person that ever walked, I think, the face of the earth when they have been around. After Hubbard fled from England, where he'd been conducting some fascinating research on plants' reactions to pain and pleasure, something incidentally paralleled in the States seven years later with CIA funding, he went to Las Palmas in 1966 and went to ground. The only person to see him then was Virginia Downsborough, now practicing Scientology divorced from the church. For several months, she nursed him through an illness and a severe depression. He felt, I think, that he'd done all the research he was going to do and that he really wanted to die at that time. He was... Uh, out of communication with St. Hill, totally. He was out of communication with Mary Sue. So was Mary Sue, his wife, running the show from St. Hill? For a few months, Hubbard was not at the helm, and the point was not missed by his friends, Pam and Ray Camp. From the moment that he actually left the country and uh, uh, formed his own floating sea org, 
he lost touch with all of reality and Hubbard only had around him those people who did as he said. Well, that's because why he formed his messenger service that's right, originally. Absolutely right, who now run the whole goddamn thing, forget the French, but that's the way it is. So what he was no longer looking at society as it was. He was now getting information from all of these mm -hmm. other people who were his eyes and ears of the world. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, they didn't even know the subject. <clears throat> So, in a sense, he was intellectually disorientated. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Putting it but another way, he was fed false data. I mean, it's like, it's like a computer, you know, giggle. Garbage in, garbage out. Afloat by 1967, aboard the old Royal Scotman ferry, renamed Apollo, the Scientology Sea Org, so-called, went into camouflage under the title of Operation and Transport Corporation Limited. Jerry Armstrong says they were masquerading as business management consultants, and that in itself aroused suspicion. Well, we were telling the locals that we were Operation and Transport Corporation Limited, this wonderful business management corporation, and bring them on board, tour them through the right, or through the starboard tween decks of the ship, and up through another little area, and off they'd go, or you know, we'd have a band playing on board, while the rest of the ship is engaged in running Scientology or why they called us a CIA intelligence operation. We had a cover, and we had an intent, which was to move our way into the power structure in whatever country we were in, in order to, as Hubbard said, assure ourselves of safe ports. So was Hubbard continuing to act out the only role for which he'd been thoroughly trained, that of intelligence? Or was he withdrawing from the real world and dragging Scientology with him? The benign influence of LRH deteriorated completely with the build-up of the Guardian's office. Which we got wind of in 75 when we went to visit a dear friend of ours who literally told us, if you think L. Ron Hubbard is running this organization, you're deadly mistaken because he is... Round here, he is known as Mary, uh, Mary Sue Hubbard's husband. husband. You've seen the intelligence check sheets. You've seen where they're trained on intelligence techniques, burglaries, plants, blackmail, sex, you, the whole thing. And everyone within the organization knew to report on anything that happened. So wife reported on husband, husband on wife, and the whole thing has this intelligence mentality to it. The pattern was thus set for the excesses practiced by the Guardian's office for some years, and the Church has since publicly condemned what happened in this period. There's no reason to suppose that Hubbard was unaware of what was going on, but he seemed to withdraw more and more from direct involvement, and his young aides observed enormous mood swings over which he'd little control. He considered himself to be allergic to, um, I think it was 30 or 40 different um, things. Um, I've seen him actually literally eat a handful of pills, start throwing them down, gulping water and throwing one of them down until he got through this huge handful of vitamins, antibiotics, enzyme pills and um, antacid. He had a big uh, Harley and uh, he fell off the bike and he damaged his shoulders and he became a petulant, utter asshole after that for several months. And he had, in my opinion, incredibly low tolerance for pain. So I'm nearly dead. The reason why I was called to audit him in 1978, when I got there, he was almost in a coma. And this doctor had grabbed a power cord for a kettle and ripped the plug off one end of it and bared the wires ready to put an electric jolt on his heart. And he was convinced he was on the edge of death. That was David Mayo, Hubbard's personal auditor. Hubbard had returned finally to the United States in 1975 and went to ground. Although he resumed communications with a number of old friends, none of them ever knew where he was. There were a number of times when there were announcements of raid threats and we all mustered together and destroyed evidence. There always was a getaway car kept tuned up and tweaked on and kept ready. If anyone arrived at the property, instantly the messengers and various people throughout the property were alerted by, by radio. 
we were instructed and drilled to not accept service of process, to kick them away, to deny Hubbard's living there. Hubbard's safety was paramount. In 1980, as Hubbard's wife Mary Sue and other members of the Guardian's office were sentenced for stealing documents from state agencies, he vanished. From then until his death in January 1985, at most five people were privy to his movements, actions and moods. And then in 1983, new science fiction began to appear under his name. Battlefield Earth and the immense decalogy, Mission Earth. They were brilliantly publicised and on the whole very well received. In fact, one has just been nominated for a sci-fi Hugo Award. Perry Chapdelaine. My theory is that Hubbard looked over the expanding field of science fiction that occurred right after Star Wars and said, well, uh, maybe I should go in and tap that vein again. The way to tap the vein is to sit down and indulge myself and write some Cracker Jack ac action adventure stories. A chance once more to be remembered as a science fiction writer and to win new recruits to Scientology. The whole of the latter part of Hubbard's life suggests that he truly believed himself to be in a race against time to save the world. And according to Hannah Eltringham Whitfield, Hubbard knew his mission couldn't succeed in one lifetime. He brought out late one night the problem, how would he handle dying and coming back the next time so that, number one, people would recognize who he was, and two, he would have the money on hand to restore Scientology or um, correct it if he needed to. And he was genuinely, genuinely looking at that problem. Do you think in, in setting up, in the end, a fairly wealthy trust, he had at least achieved the potential? That's what he was looking at. He also mentioned at those times that this is the first lifetime where he had the three ingredients that he had been looking for for many lifetimes, and those three were the money, the finance, the people, and the policy and the technology. And he was able to put those three together this lifetime. Money put by for Hubbard's next lifetime. Sometimes, just sometimes, it's necessary to suspend our disbelief in order to approach the truth. Here, in the fragments of his life I've been able to verify, are the keys not only to the real Ron Hubbard, but ultimately to the Church of Scientology. No one is suggesting that you have to accept reincarnation and all that stuff. Put it aside. In my view, Hubbard has been squeezed out of history. Perhaps the time has come for a dispassionate evaluation of the life and times of L. Ron Hubbard, innovator, science fiction writer of the Golden Age, explorer, patriot, yes, and scientist. Yes, power was part of it. But I don't know how much it was just power. I think it was a step further. He had the altruistic goals there. I think that his enormous contribution was the integration of this planet's knowledge into a really extremely workable technology. They have this big lawsuit saying he was a fraud, he was a this, he was a that. No, he wasn't. He wasn't any of those things. All of those people went in on their own free will, paid their money on their own free will when they adored this man to pay for their services, right? And every one of those people that I know were his um, loyal subjects. That was what was wrong with them. And he used to complain about people who dropped out of society into Scientology. Yes, but of course that's what a cult is all about. Like he was a man who was not immoral, he was a man who was amoral. He was outside the social framework in many respects. But aren't all geniuses. And pretty soon you got the man made into a god or a super superhuman being that lived ten lives while the rest of us are living one. That was Ruthless Adventure, The Lives of L. Ron Hubbard. It was presented by Margaret Percy and produced by Graham Tyre.